Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. You take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Now last week we were in... uh, the section about the Lord's Supper, when Jesus institutes the Supper there in 26. Today, we're going to be after that. Now we're going further into 26, and we're going to look at his time in the garden, which begins in verse 36. So 36 through 46 will be the text today. 36 through 46, and I'm going to entitle the message, In Gethsemane. So we've been... We've been proceeding along with Lent through the last chapters of Matthew. We began over in 24, and then we had a couple of messages out of 25, and now here in 26, last week with the supper, this week with uh, the garden. And so we're in the garden. We're going to begin our reading here then in verse 36. Then Jesus, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, And saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Pray ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will. But as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy, and he left them, and he went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that that doeth betray me. So after the supper, they ended the, they ended the supper, and they sang a hymn, and they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, we are in the Mount of Olives there, the Olivet Discourse from 24 to 25. Then we left, and we went to the home of Simon the leper, who was no longer a leper, right? He's a trophy of grace now. And then we had the supper after that, and after the supper, they sang a hymn. They went back to the Mount of Olives. But this time, they're going to a specific location, the Garden of Gethsemane. So he tells the disciples there in 31 through 35 about his upcoming suffering, their scattering, and Peter's denial. Because, of course, Peter says, you know, oh, if everybody leaves you, I won't be the one to do that. And Jesus says, oh, yeah, you're going to deny me three times before the night's over. And uh, so they, he, he gives them that, and then they come to the Garden. Now... I don't know where Gethsemane is. There are lots of uh, there are lots of supposed locations of Gethsemane, and if you go over there to, and you see the Mount of Olives, you'll see several churches built, and I'm sure one of them, I think maybe the Church of All Nations, is built on what they think is the site of the Garden. But there are other proposed sites. Everybody has an idea. Everybody's built a church there. But no one really knows for certain where this is. All we know is it was probably a walled garden somewhere near the foot of olives, the foot of the Mount of Olives. And they, so they enter into this garden, and it must have been private or something. And Jesus must have known who owned it. They went into the garden, and he tells the disciples, you'll notice there in verse 36, uh, yeah, in 36, then cometh Jesus with them to a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Now, prayer was not a, a strange thing for Jesus. We have him praying many times in the Gospels. Uh, some of the most precious times of prayer are in Matthew chapter 14, Luke 9, Mark 6. We find him going off into the mountain to pray alone all night long. 
Remember that? That's when the disciples were out on the sea in the boat after he sent the multitudes away after feeding them. And he goes up to the mountain to pray. Of course, he teaches the disciples the Lord's Prayer uh, in the um, Sermon um, yeah, the sermon on the Mount. And, and then also we have him um, praying that great high priestly prayer, prayer in John chapter 17. So prayer is nothing uh, new for Jesus to be engaged in. But notice what he says to the disciples. He says, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. So he says, sit here, I'm going to go over there. Sit here, I'm going to go over there. What a grand, what grand direction that he gives the disciples. What wonderful condescension. You know, every time that Jesus has people sit down, it's usually because he's going to serve them. You know, we find him seating people you know, when he feeds them in the feeding of the 5,000 of the 7,000 and so forth, we find Jesus seeding people. And we find, uh, we find in his parables, for example, the parable of the householder, when he returns and he finds his servants doing well, he tells them to sit, and then he girds himself and serves them. So to be seated by the Lord is an honor. It's, it's a privilege. And so I think maybe without the disciples knowing it, this is the last privilege that they're going to receive from him as far as this kind of honor. And he says, sit here. You guys just sit right here. I'm going to go over there and pray. Yeah. Their world was about to change, and they didn't even know it. He said, sit here, and they thought, oh, well, here, this is going to be, he's going to serve us again. And sure enough, he was about to do just that. He gives the disciples a place at the gate of the dark garden, but they're not allowed to go into the place with him. They're told to sit. He honors them with that. But then he goes off by himself and takes Peter, James, and John. Notice verse 37. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Now these three are not strangers to being, you know, a part of something wonderful. Uh, they went into Jairus' house and saw Jairus' daughter raised. The rest of the disciples didn't go with him there. These three went with him to the Mount of Transfiguration, where again they saw Jesus pray. And while he was praying, he was transfigured before them. So th this is not something new. Jesus calls Peter, James, and John and says, Come on, fellas, you're going to go a little bit further into the garden with me. And they go. These three went with him. And he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. These Greek words are very interesting. The depth of grief that gripped him. He was troubled and distressed. Sorrowful and very heavy. Troubled and distressed. Your translation may have something just slightly different than that. The hour was almost upon him, and he alone knew the singular path that he must walk. And he alone knew exactly what he was about to bear. I don't think that we will ever know. We will never know. Because he could look to the future and see what was coming. He knew the cross, that grotesque thing stood not very far away, and that he would be on it. But that wasn't it. That wasn't what made him sorrowful and very heavy. It was the thought of what would happen on that cross. It wasn't just that he would suffer physically, but he was going to suffer spiritually. Because God would turn his back on his son while he was on that cross. And he would become the propitiation for our sins on that cross. He would be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And how heavy, ladies and gentlemen, is that sin? All I know is the sin of this man is heavy. And I can't even imagine what it would be for the sins of all those who would come to Christ that he would bear on that cross. Can't, I, we can't even begin to think of the darkness and the horror of that thought. He would bear all of that? The sinless son of God? Yes, he was sorrowful and very heavy because he saw it coming. He was troubled, distressed, sorrowful. He knew what was coming, and he knew also that only he could walk that path. Only he could walk that path. Verse 38, he saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Well, we've said this before, haven't we? We've said something to this effect. I feel like I'm going to die. We know we're not going to die, but it's an expression. It, we feel like everything's about to come to an end. It's just horrible. The weight of something is just so emotionally great 
It just stresses our soul to the point where we say, I just, I feel like I'm going to die. That's kind of the expression that we have here when Jesus says to them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. And notice that he mentions his soul is exceeding sorrowful. Here we have in full view the humanity of Jesus. He was fully God and fully man. And now the soul of the Son of Man is exposed. He feels what's about to happen. He sees what's ahead. It's too much. Too much. And he is exceeding sorrowful, broken. And he knows the horror of, about, of what is about to happen. And he says to his three, Peter, James, and John, Tarry ye here and watch with me. Tarry ye here and watch with me. He didn't expect them to bear what he was bearing. He didn't expect them to understand what he understood. He didn't expect them to have the same vision of the cross and all the, all the darkness and the hellishness of that thing. But he just asked them to pray. Tarry with me. Watch with me. Again, what wonderful direction, what grand condescension we have as the Savior points out for them right here, tarry here, and watch with me. They couldn't go with him. They couldn't help him carry the burden. They couldn't, they couldn't do anything of the sort, but they could pray for him. They could stay awake with him so that there was camaraderie there with him. And these three had a particular insight into what Perhaps he was going through because they had seen his glorification. They saw him fully God on the Mount of Transfiguration, and now they see him fully man in the Garden of Gethsemane. So they get the full view. They get the, they get the full view of Jesus. They got the whole thing. So Jesus asked them to tarry and to watch. I don't know. I have been... I have been pondering and chewing on this and, and thinking about this since I first decided to preach this passage. These, this instruction that Jesus gives these disciples, tarry ye here while I go and pray yonder. And then here in 38, tarry ye here and watch with me. I just, it's so wonderful that he gives that to them. And what, is he, what would he say to us? Would he tell us anything different? He honors us in the same way, and he gives us the same command. Watch and pray. And he went a little further, this time without the three. So we have the, how, how many is there? Nine. We have the, well, at minus one, Judas is gone. Eight. Eight there at the gate where they entered into the garden. Maybe there's sort of a little vestibule or area where you can gather, and maybe they had benches or some sort of low seating there, and there the eight were, and Jesus says, sit here. While I go there. And then he goes a little farther with Peter, James, and John, and he tarries them. He, he says to them, Tarry ye here. And then it says that he went further on into the garden, away where he could have some privacy. And he fell on his face. Luke has that he kneels. Here we have the him prostrate on the ground. He's flat on his face and praying. A little further in. Oh, how he suffered for us. The darkness was upon him. He prays into the dust. Can't you see that, that picture? He's laid flat, face down, praying into the dust of the ground. That same dust that he whispered into and created Adam. And now he's praying into the dust of the ground and he whispers his prayer. He also shows us how to respond to suffering, doesn't he? What did Jesus do when he was exceeding sorrowful and heavy, very heavy, and even unto death? What do you do? Well, I know what Jesus did. He prayed. He prayed. And who did he pray to? He prayed to his father, saying, Oh, my father. See, there's only one port of call in which to dock his soul, and he appeals to his father for help. Just like the psalmist tells us, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. 
And so he appeals to his father for help in this hour and says, if it be possible. Jesus taught that with God nothing was impossible. So we know that the if here is is not an if of doubt or of confusion. It's not that at all. Because with God all things are possible. It wasn't the possibility thing that was in question. Listen to Dr. Broadus on this point. He says, Jesus means, quote, morally possible, consistent with the Father's purpose of saving men. The God-man speaks according to his suffering, human nature, referring all to the Father. Yes, he is suffering. This is the, this is the God-man, but this is the man side that's praying here. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, he had just instituted the Lord's Supper, giving the church the cup of the New Testament in his blood. But for Christ, there was another cup. There was the cup of vinegar that he would drink. The cup of God's wrath poured out on Christ's soul for the remission of sins. And who should it pass to if it wasn't for him to drink? There's no one else. He alone was able to drink it. If it's possible, we all understand this. We don't want to go through the suffering. We don't want to face that trial. And Jesus is just the same. He doesn't want to face that trial. He feels what's about to happen. He does, none of this escapes him. Verse 42, he says, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Notice that the cup is still the object of concern even further on in the story in verse 42 when he prays again. This cup, it's that, it's that cup, that thing that symbolizes what's about to happen to him. But now the words except I drink it point us to the glorious knowledge that Christ Jesus knew exactly what his mission was and that he alone could carry it out. Except I drink it. He knew that no one else could. And so he, it's not that he is trying to change God's mind here. What he's trying to do is align his human will with the divine. He's talking, and, and we do this too, don't we? We say to ourselves, okay, now this is what's going to happen. You know, and we sort of talk ourselves into what's about to happen. And we maybe go through the steps in our mind, and maybe we say those steps out loud. And then, you know, I think that's what's going on here. There's no doubt that he's going to the cross. There's no doubt about that grotesque horror that's before him. There's no doubt about what's going to happen for the souls and lives of men that he's dying for. There's no doubt about the, any of that, ladies and gentlemen, and he knows it. But here we see, we see laid out before us in glorious, wonderful fashion the humanity of Christ. And then notice those words next, nevertheless, nevertheless. Nevertheless, it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter how bad it's going to be. It doesn't matter how dark it looks. It doesn't matter, not as I will, but as thou wilt. This prayer was never about changing the Father's mind, but really about aligning the human, with, the human will with the divine will. Jesus came to do his Father's will, and he tells us that over and over again. Not as I will, but as thou wilt, because he told the Jews In John chapter 5 and again in John chapter 6 about the Father's will, he said in 5, John 5, 30, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. And then John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40, he says, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which he hath sent me, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. This is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. You see, the Father's will and Jesus' will was perfectly aligned. He came to do the will of the Father, not his own. And the Father's will was that if anybody believed on him, Jesus would raise him up, and he says there at the end, I will raise him up. Yeah, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. What a wonderful plan. Thank God that Jesus was willing, 
But of course he was willing. He was always willing. He came to do the will of God. And in verse 40, he comes unto the disciples. Now, last time we saw the disciples was right there in um, 38. We're talking about Peter, James, and John. And he told them, tarry ye here and watch with me. So we come through his prayer, at least sometime after this prayer. He comes unto the disciples, in verse 40, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Now, you notice that I'm reading from the King James, Could ye not watch with me? That ye is plural. That's a second person plural word, ye. If it's singular, it would be thou. But here it's ye. Could ye not watch with me one hour? It's one of the things that's beautiful about King James English is that when we say you, you means singular you. You can also mean plural you. Or sometimes we'll say y'all or yuns, you know. Sometimes we'll use those things, but the you is always just, you know, what it's just that's how we pronounce it. Sometimes we mean it, sometimes we mean it singular, sometimes we mean it plural. It just depends on the context of our, you know, sentence at the moment. But in the King James, we have ye and thou, and we can understand which is plural and which is not just by looking at the word. And here, even though he says unto Peter, he's talking to all three of them, because he said to them, tarry ye here and watch with me. And now he comes to Peter, and I, and I don't know, just in my, just in my imagination, I, I wonder if Jesus didn't take his foot and kind of tap him on the shoulder, you know, Peter, so he would wake up, and he's... And he's and Peter probably hit the rest of them, you know. And Jesus says, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now, they were asleep when Jesus asked them to watch with him. They went to sleep. And the wonderful direction and condescension that they were given were abused by them, ignored by these men. They just thought, well, Jesus has gone in there to pray. Yeah, he's sorrowful and very heavy, but I'm sleepy. And you can imagine why. It's late in the day. <clears throat> it's nighttime. They have eaten the meal, a big meal. They ate the Passover meal, and then they had the Lord's Supper together. And so they're full. They go, they walk over to Gethsemane, and it must have been a, a lovely, warm spring night. Clear, the skies were clear, and they, you know, when they sat down, it, you know, it's not very far to go from sitting down to lying down. And they fall asleep, or maybe they're leaning on each other or something. Who knows how they're, how they're positioned, but they fall asleep. And Jesus says, you couldn't watch with me one hour. So you notice that the prayer that Jesus prays there in, um, what, what verse is it? Where am I? There in, um, there in 39. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. How long did it take me to pray that? 20 seconds? 15 seconds? And yet Jesus says, you couldn't watch with me one hour? What else did he pray? He was, the, he was in there for an hour before he came back to the boys. They were asleep the whole time. Jesus was praying, and the only thing we know he prayed is this. There's a veil, ladies and gentlemen, that has been placed over the garden. We can't see into it. I don't know that we will ever see into it. It's a, it's a place that only Jesus could go. It's an experience that only he could have. And the disciples were so unworthy of that that they couldn't even stay awake for an hour. And Peter is the one mentioned here, of course, but it's all of them that, uh, that Jesus is talking to when he says, ye you could not you know, stay awake for, with me an hour. And we discover that his praying went on much longer, this hour than the, that we've just discussed. And, of course, Gethsemane is dark, and the Lord himself has pulled a veil over this, the proceedings of that place. And, and we wonder what else he may have prayed, but we'll never really know. He says to them, you couldn't watch with me one hour. And then notice he gives them a command. Watch and pray. We find this combination in the New Testament letters. 
It wasn't just for the disciples at Gethsemane, ladies and gentlemen. This is for us as well. Watch and pray. Paul writes in Colossians, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And Peter, God bless him, he learned, he learned his lesson. Because 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter writes, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Yeah, Peter learned, didn't he? And he tells us, you need to learn this too. Watch and pray. And then notice what Jesus says. I find this very interesting. He says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. What would have happened in Peter's story if instead of sleeping that night, he was found praying? And praying to prepare the way for his great temptation. What would have happened when he made it to Caiaphas' palace if he had been praying in the garden instead of asleep? You see, he was asleep in the garden, and so his soul wasn't ready for the temptation that was about to take place. He was asleep in the garden. What if he had been praying in the garden? Maybe when the little maid girl said, you too were with Jesus, he would have said, yeah, you're right, I was. I wonder if this is not a principle for us as well. Pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is not an excuse for the disciples' lack of prayer, but an incentive to pray. The spirit indeed is willing. He's ready to go. We should take advantage of the spirit's willingness and leverage his indeedness instead of allowing the weakness of our flesh to ruin our walk, which is what we most often do. Verses 42 through 44, Jesus goes away a second time and prays, saying, O Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again. So he comes back and finds the men asleep, even after he told them, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. He finds them asleep again. Their eyes were heavy. Well, that's really not an excuse, is it? Keep your eyes open. And he left them and went away again. So this is now the third time, praying and saying the same words. So we have his praying a second time and a third time throughout the night. Jesus was praying and the disciples were sleeping. And it happened all night long. So again, the veil has been pulled over what Christ was praying. We don't know all that he said. We don't know all that transpired there in that garden that night. And we never will. And we will, we, even if we knew, we would never understand it. And thank God we really don't know where Gethsemane is. Otherwise, we would build the largest cathedral in the world over it. Let them keep guessing. It's not about Gethsemane. And it's not about the disciples sleeping. It's about Jesus preparing his soul for what's about to happen. And then he comes to the betrayal. Verses, verse 45 through 46 then cometh he to his disciples. Another thing that's interesting in this, just, a, just from a, a curiosity standpoint, is how often you have the word come. He comes to Gethsemane, and then he comes back to the disciples, and then he comes to the disciples again, and then in 45 he comes back to the disciples again. This is the third time during the night that Jesus comes to his disciples. How many times do you think does he come to us finding us asleep when we should be praying. Maybe not physically, actually asleep, but asleep to our situation. Just like the disciples at the gate, you know, he told them to sit here while I go there and pray. They didn't know what was about to happen. They thought this is just another one of those times. Jesus tells us to sit down. That's great. Yeah, so maybe we're not actually asleep, but just we're asleep to our situation. We think all is well when all is not. Or, conversely, we think all is not well when it really is. Boy, that can be a bad one too, can it? We just get down in the mouth, as the old fellow used to say. Get down in the mouth and everything's bad and everything's wrong. It's not all that wrong. You've got a Savior on your side. A Savior who doesn't go to sleep, thank God. A Savior who's working on your behalf. Yeah. The reason for the confusion could very well be that we're not found watching and praying. Whether or not we think all everything's great or whether we think everything's wrong, sometimes the reason for the confusion is 
We don't watch him pray. So he comes to his disciples and he says to them, Sleep on now, take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. There comes a point of no return, you know. Jesus is ready, the disciples are not. And it doesn't matter whether the disciples are ready or not, Jesus is going to be betrayed by Judas. And it doesn't matter whether Peter is ready or not, Peter is going to be tripped up by the question of a servant girl. And it doesn't matter because these things are happening. We have a chance to get ready for those things through watching and praying, just as the disciples did. The disciples are going to scatter. What would have happened if they had been praying the whole time like Jesus? I wonder if they would have scattered quite as quickly. Verse 46, notice the words of Christ here. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. You notice that Jesus doesn't, he's not afraid of what's about to happen. He stands up there like a man and he says, okay, boys, let's go. He's here. My betrayer is here. Here, he walks right into the trap. He knows it's a trap. He knows what Judas has done. He knows where they're going to take him. He knows what lies ahead of him. He says, let's go. I'm ready to go. Why was he ready to go? He spent the night in prayer. He was ready. He was ready to do his father's will. It was a glory to him. It was a joy. And these sleepy-eyed disciples, they, they stagger up out of their sleep. And here comes Judas and the rest of the mob, and they take Jesus, and everybody runs away. Everybody runs away. Sleep on now, take your rest. Arise, let us be going, he says. He is at hand that doth betray me. And where were they going? Well, Jesus right away is going to Caiaphas' palace. And the disciples are going into hiding. Peter is going to sneak in to the uh, place where they were going to judge Jesus in Caiaphas' palace, sit around the fire with the rest of them. Maybe he could see what was going on. He had a morbid curiosity about what was to happen, but he wasn't ready. So how do we apply this? Well, number one, I think our application should be this. The garden experience teaches us about the wonderful Humility of Christ and his humanity, his full humanity. Fully God and fully man is a fact of the gospel story that is hard to be grasped, but we get a glimpse of it here in the garden, just like we got a glimpse of his full divinity on the Mount of Transfiguration. We see both now, and we understand it, because I can't understand the Mount of Transfiguration at all, but I can understand the Garden of Gethsemane. Because his soul was exceedingly troubled. I understand exceedingly troubled. Although I will never know exactly what he was facing, I will never be able to see the vision of what he looked at because the darkness and the horror of that must have been more than any man could take. And so we see his humanity, which is hard to grasp, but which is evident in every page of the telling of the gospel, but especially here in the garden. Secondly, every one of us knows or will know the dark night of the soul. And some of you who are here in this congregation have suffered in ways that I will never be able to understand. Your loss and the pain that you have suffered in this life is more than most of us will ever be able to recognize. But I know somebody who does. Jesus. He recognizes it. He understands it. He's felt it. He's felt what you've felt. He's un- he understands the dark night of the soul better than anyone else. Yeah, we go through our own version of Gethsemane in this life. But I think the question is, were we found in prayer there? Jesus knows. Jesus knows our pain. He knows our sorrow. He knows because he's been there. He went there before us. And then thirdly, I just want to go back to the question I posed earlier. Can watching and praying help us with our struggle against temptation and sin? Let me quote again from Dr. Broadus. He says, observe that it is not merely, quote, that you may overcome temptation, or 
that you may be supported under temptation. But what does Jesus say? That you may not come into temptation. Which means that you may avoid being tempted. So watching and praying helps us to avoid temptation altogether. Something about watching and praying has an effect on the soul that is astringent against the infection of temptation and sin. It does something to us and prepares us for that battle. It, it steals us in that fight. And so watching and praying, which I think, ladies and gentlemen, is the great command for the church right here, right now, especially in these last days. <clears throat> it is time for us to watch and to pray. Because temptation is coming for the church and, in many ways, is already here. Yes, our Savior went before us. This is a part of his passion and a part of his suffering. And now he's going on to Caiaphas' house and he's going to be abused there by Caiaphas. And then on to Pilate, who's going to abuse him even further. And then on to the cross, where he'll be abused even further and die on that cruel, horrible thing with every one of us in mind. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.